is the presence of well-mannered dialogue and conversation. Of course, dialogue, at least in the form of it being enlightening, requires the parties involved to be willing to engage in productive, empathetic, and honest conversations. However, these days we see a lack of this on both sides. So my question is how do we move forward with our current state of low quality discourse and what needs to happen to better engage with those of different parties? And then I'll add for you, um, and as a political figure, will you reflect on the manner in which you discuss political issues and notice possible areas in which your style of argumentation increases inter-party division? Thank you. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, um, I'll reflect on it. I will say, I, I'm, I will be very proud of how we allow people who disagree at every single event to come to the front of the line. We've made that a rule over a decade, and I think that's a really good thing, and I, hope, I wish more people would do that. Um, but look, I, I will say, let's just use a, a huge example. Was it the American right or largely the American left that engaged in active censorship in the 2020 election? Really? So do you think, who has a greater speech problem? Like a, a tolerance of different ideas, right or left? And I don't mean to overly politicize it, I just want to try to isolate it so we can fix it. Sure, absolutely. I actually wasn't disagreeing with you on this point. It was more so uh, okay. that I, I do agree it is the left um, that's in right. question here, but I wanted your opinion uh, on the state of discourse. And the no, the state of discourse is awful. Uh, it's terrible. When I, I'll give you an example. This didn't happen here, and I was surprised, to be honest. I went to go speak at Arizona State University uh, with Dennis Prager, not exactly the most controversial person, right? Maybe you feel like a disagreement about Deuteronomy or something. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I, I love Dennis, but not exactly controversial. And the professors, right, 33 out of 40 of the professors at Arizona State University said we should not be allowed to come on campus, right? Th that, that is not a liberal value. That, that's a Bolshevik value, right? And you have to wonder what, what motivates them to want to sign a petition like that to try to prevent that kind of dialogue and discourse from occurring. So, I mean, look, the, the trajectory right now towards censorship overall is very bad, it's very damaging, and people get angrier, right? So one of the things I'm encouraged is when people that don't agree with me come to events like this, and maybe they'll think a little bit differently about one or two items. I think that de-radicalizes the country. My, my, my question always is, have you sat through and listened to somebody where it's their job to defend the worldview? All of our Turning Point kids have. They go to college. They do it every single day, right? And so the question is, have people on the left done that? And I think that's what very healthy. And look, when people are very angry and frustrated, they listen to demagogues more. And free speech is not just, you know, it's not just fun, as I mentioned. Free speech is very healing because I believe it appeals to people's reason and it appeals to their ability to make informed decisions and inherently will de-radicalize a country. And the problem is, if you, one of the reasons why the American right was so upset, and I was with them in the post-2020 election, is that we had the FBI colluding with Twitter to cover up the Hunter Biden laptop story. We had 50 intel agency officials say that it was Russian disinformation. Mark Zuckerberg set, set, stifled it and censored it. I go through the whole list, right? Many of you know this, some of you might not. And that is one of the most flagrant and unforgivable actions of election interference in our country's history. And so don't be shocked when people get very brazen and upset. 